Teresa. Okay. Thanks very much, Teresa, uh, for inviting me up, and also thanks to Olivia for doing um, the organising of the session today. Um, yeah, so what I'm here to talk to you about really is individual fellowships, but while I'm here, I'm also going to take the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the other programmes that Teresa mentioned, specifically the Research and Innovation Staff Exchange and also the um, Training Networks programme. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of what the whole Marie Skodowska Curie Action Programme looks like and then focus into the individual fellowships because that's the one with the next deadline that maybe you should be thinking about um, getting ready for now. So as Teresa said, um, I'm based in Dublin. Um, I work at the Irish Universities Association. Now we, of course, are the sectoral body for the Irish Universities, but um, the Marie Curie office that I run is really a service offering for the entire research community, um, and we like to kind of say on the whole island of Ireland. So um, we try as much as possible to provide support to researchers in Queen's University and University of Ulster, and also sort of working with Invest Northern Ireland on companies north of the border uh, as well. So we really have three main functions in this program. Is that be okay on the video conference? Okay. Um, we have three main functions really in the IUA um, in the office. We try our best to promote the actions as widely as possible. We try to support as much as possible researchers in preparing their funding applications and also we try to contribute a little bit to the development of the program and other policy initiatives that are relevant to the actions. Um, as of July last year, we are now two people in the office, uh, myself as national contact point and also as national delegate, which means I sit on the programme committee in Brussels where I have the chance to put forward sort of Ireland's opinion on how the programmes are developed and so I'm there with the UK NCP, the French, uh, other people as well. Um, and then I have my colleague Suzanne Miller Delaney who joined us in July last year and she is there to provide dedicated support to the 12 large scale research centres that were established by Science Foundation Ireland, our main research funding body, over the last um, two years or so. So she's there to kind of do the hand holding. Um, so we have a very large client base because we cover every single area of research. Suzanne's is kind of smaller than mine and I have the job of looking after absolutely everybody else. So Mary Skudowska Curie, um, I usually do a little pronunciation guide actually on the slides, but I took it away because I thought people had it, had it figured out at this stage, <laughs> but obviously not. <laughs> so uh, it, I've been told the start of it is squo, like squash, so squo dovska, so the W is like a V. So if you ever become a Mary Skudowska Curie Fellow, I suppose the least you can do is figure out how to actually say it properly. So it's part of Horizon 2020, which you've probably all heard lots and lots and lots about. That has three main pillars, excellent science, industrial leadership and societal challenges. Marius Skodowska Curie is in the excellent science pillar. Um, along with things like the European Research Council, uh, research infrastructures and future and emerging technologies. It has about 6.2 billion euro um, of the 80 billion euro allocated for Horizon 2020. And in common with say the ERC, um, it funds all research areas. So it doesn't matter whether you are an applied mathematician, an archaeologist, a historian, a physicist, you can apply for funding from this particular program. There are no thematic calls or priority areas. So you don't have to look at a work program and they say, oh, we'd really like to receive proposals in the following areas and you have to try and figure out whether you can fit your proposal into that team. In fact, you can actually just um, apply for whatever you want um, and you decide what your, your research area is going to be. So instead of having thematic calls, we instead have five different kinds of programs that you can apply to. So we have training networks, staff exchange, fellowships, etc. Um, and when I'm asked what the Marriage of Glossary Curie Action is about and what makes it different from the other parts of Horizon 2020, what I usually say is that Instead of being really about the research that's going to be performed, although of course that's important, it's more important that you look at the researchers that take part in the program and how it will benefit their training, their career development and their mobility by being involved in these programs. So these are what the calls look like. We have um, actually four calls a year. Um, but one of them happens every two years and that's European Research Society and I'll explain that in a moment. So we have the Research and Innovation Staff Exchange, we have Innovative Training Networks, we have CoFund, we have European Researchers Night and we have the Individual Fellowships Programme. Um, the four first programmes really are for um, people who are sort of leading research teams to have a look at. CoFund in particular is probably more suitable for large scale research centres that have a portion of funding that they could put towards the programme and get co-financing. Individual fellowships is about individual researchers and that's what makes a difference. 
Just to start off talking about the Research and Innovation Staff Exchange Scheme, this has a policy focus of promoting transfer of knowledge between countries and sectors. And this is one of the programmes where they really encourage you to work with countries outside of Europe. So one of the overarching cross-cutting themes in Horizon 2020 is international cooperation. So this is one of the schemes which fulfills that requirement where you're encouraged to look at Chile, South Africa, China, India, all sorts of countries um, as potential partners for these programmes. What you do is you get together a consortium of people and you put together an idea for a project. Um, then you receive funding to take the people you already have working in your organisation and send them off on secondment for any duration between one month and a year and you can split it into shorter visits to basically work on the project in another partner within your consortium. In addition to that, for every month of secondment that occurs, you get a budget for networking activities and training activities that are supposed to be sort of capacity building to build and share the expertise and transfer more knowledge between the different programs. As I said, it's possible to collaborate with any sector. So in Marie Skodowska Curie Actions, one of the things they're quite keen on is this intersectional cooperation, this idea of the academic sector, like universities, public research organizations, working with the non-academic sector, which is basically anybody else, so industry, National Archives, libraries, museums, NGOs, charities, for example, who might like to get involved in these particular programs. So as I said, it's possible to collaborate with any sector and any country worldwide. Uh, there's no mobility rules here, so in some of the other programs we have rules about people being able to apply for fellowships in certain countries depending on how long they've lived there. This doesn't apply in this case, and you can go anywhere you like. Um, the budget is it's, it's small, it's not a huge program, um, and it's €2,000 per month to the researcher to help cover their travel costs while they're on the convent. And for every €2,000 that occurs, another €2,500 starts to build up a fund. So if you have 10 months of the common, you get 25,000 euro for helping towards the research costs, training, networking, organizing events. The good news is that because this is a new program, um, they got very few applications first time around. So the success rate was actually 45% and 70% of our applications down in the Republic of Ireland were funded. Um, the call just closed last week, uh, or was last week, two weeks ago, on the 20th of April. Um, they had 350 something applications this time around, so quite a jump, but they actually slightly increased the budget as well. So I think the success rate will be more like between 25 and 30% this time around. But when you contrast that with another program which has a 6% success rate, you can see that this actually might be a good bet and something that if you, you know, worked hard and got a bit of help from Teresa and her colleagues and myself on it, you could really get these proposals over the line. Now, just to explain, when I say your staff moving, around the consortium, it's kind of a catch-all term. It means anybody involved in research. So it's PhD students, it can be masters by research students too, postdocs, um, the group leaders themselves, any technical administrative or management staff that are associated with the project as well. So if you had a large-scale research centre that had the technical team, also had, say, a centre director, um, a centre manager, those people would be able to go on the secondments as well and take part in the networking activities. Sorry, and I meant to say that the next call for that program is uh, probably going to open um, sometime around December this year and close in April um, of next year as well. They plan to run things roughly on the same schedule right until 2020, but I don't know yet. We, we haven't seen any, any tentative deadlines. So uh, the project can be of any duration up to 48 months long. I have seen projects that are just one year long. I have seen projects that are two, three, and four years. It depends on what you need to make your program work. Uh, the minimum consortium is three separate participants in three separate countries. So it means basically one organization from UK, one organization from France, one organization from Germany. And what we're really trying to encourage, and that's kind of partly one of the reasons why I'm here today, is that when people in Northern Ireland consider applying for a program that they look to the Republic of Ireland to see if they can find a partner to make up one of those three that they need um, as a minimum. And equally, we in the Republic of Ireland are encouraging people to look north of the border to find partners as well. And we've already had a number of successes, particularly in the RISE program. We had two projects funded last year, which involved partners from cross-border and the WASC card one was one of them. I'm gonna show that as one of my examples in a few minutes. So, there are two million conditions. So if you keep the whole program within Europe, so you don't have any international partners, 
as a minimum, you have to have one partner from another sector. So, for example, if it was a university in Dublin, University of Ulster here, you'd have to have, say, a company or a charity from Germany, and that could be your minimum eligible consortium. Um, if you push it outside of Europe and you look at countries that are away from Europe, I always seem to use Chile as an example. I don't know why. Maybe I'd like to go to Chile. That seems to be the first country that comes to mind when I think of a non-European country. But anyway, it could be, for example, a university um, down south. It could be a university here, and it could be a university in Chile. And we have seen examples of projects which are completely international and only involve universities and public research organisations. We've seen examples of projects which are completely within Europe and have that intersectoral mix. And we've also seen examples of projects where there's a mix of both. You have international partners, European partners, different sectors as well. And from what we've been told by the Commission, there's no, it doesn't affect the competitiveness of your proposal to have a consortium that's completely not international, completely European. Um, it really doesn't matter. It's all about the quality of the project. Okay, so I always kind of think instead of giving you a load of rules and regulations about these programs, the easiest thing to show you is a, a sample project. And so this is the one that's coordinated by the um, University of Ulster. It involves Waterford Institute of Technology um, in, down the very, very bottom of Ireland. We have INSA Leon, which is a publicly funded research organisation in France. We have a company in Croatia. We have the Southern Health and Social Care Trust here in Northern Ireland, and we have a company called Intellisense, um, which is also here in, in Northern Ireland. Now, the program has certain rules about which kind of secondments it will, it will cover. So in this particular program, um, researchers from the University of Ulster um, could receive that 2,000 euro a month in order to travel to the company in Croatia, and vice versa. Um, the reason why they can't be paid to go anywhere else is because once you're within Europe, all of your secondments must cross a border and cross a sector. So they have to be from a university in one country to a company in another country or vice versa. Waterford has a couple more options. Um, it can go to Croatia, it can also go to the organisation in Northern Ireland, it can go to the company in Northern Ireland as well, and Inta Leon has the same, uh, has the, the same secondment rules. And once they have put together a common program and they figure out how many secondments they're going to have. They then have this budget for research training and networking. And basically everybody can go to those particular events. And they tend to organize them maybe, maybe twice a year where they get everybody together. They maybe get an expert in to deliver a training course. They have a seminar. We do a colloquium. Um, and just all about exchanging experience. <coughs> My second example is um, a completely international project. So this is one that doesn't involve any uh, non-academic, no companies, no charities, no NGOs. It just literally has all uh, universities. I'm not even going to attempt to explain what it's about. As you can see, it's very different from the other one. Um, and this one is coordinated by the University of Plymouth, and it involves universities in Belgium, another university in the UK, and also this public research organization in Spain. Then it has three international partners. So it has a university from Ethiopia, a university from Nepal, and the Scripps Institute um, from the US. Now, the reason why the Scripps Institute is in red is because although the Commission is keen on encouraging people to really work with partners overseas, they're also aware that there are certain countries that have really high research budgets who, if they want to get involved at Horizon 2020, can partially pay for their own participation. So the US is one of those countries, of course. So what this project will basically pay for in terms of secondments is University of Plymouth to go to Ethiopia and Nepal and to send researchers back. In the case of the US organization, people from Plymouth can go to the US and have that paid for. But if people from the US want to go to Plymouth, they have to basically find the money themselves from their own budget. Now, there are some organizations in certain international countries that are basically saying, we have money for Horizon 2020, so if you're successful in a Horizon 2020 project, come to us and we'll give you the US money that you need. Uh, certain countries, I think um, Argentina has started to put that into place, and Brazil is also looking at it as well. Though it's complex in Brazil because they have lots of different funding agencies for each of the different they have a federal system in Brazil, so it's quite, quite complex. But they are looking at making that available for people. And then the rules actually for the comment in this particular program are the same for all of the partners. So for Ghent, they would also be able to swap people with Ethiopia, with Nepal, and, uh, and send people to the Scripps Institute. But having said that, the, the Scripps Institute can still come to all the project meetings. So if you have a partner in one of those countries, so they are kind of high income countries, 
there's a list on the EU website of countries that can get funding from Horizon 2020. Um, and typically the ones that have been left off from that are kind of obvious ones like the US, Canada, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, um, the BRIC countries now, Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, South Africa can be in these projects and receive funding. Um, places like the United Arab Emirates, for example, wealthy states um, would not uh, be able to, would have to find their own money to send people in these particular projects. It doesn't seem to be a barrier for, to participation. I think those countries are still the most popular ones that people tend to apply within the project. Okay, so I'm just going to pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions on the RISE program before I move on? <laughs> No. Absolutely not. It's, it's, about it's about the mobility. Now, you know, it is, you have to play a game with these, <coughs> excuse me, with these EU programs. Essentially, they want to see something that is cutting edge, that is advancing the state of the art, depend, depending on what the state of the art is in your particular field, and something that you can write a convincing case that working on it will have a benefit to the European economy or society. That's pretty much what you have to do. And then there's a whole aspect in Marie Curie about career development as well. So you also talk about how the project will benefit the careers of the researchers that take part in it. But essentially you can work on whatever you like. And you saw that there was one about soil sedimentation. Um, there's one about, that one was about cardiac arrhythmias. We have projects in, there's one about and um, empowering women female entrepreneurship. There's projects about um, engaging the scientific diaspora around the world. Like they're really, really, really diverse. Um, it's funny, like I always think it's a great idea to find your own research project. Sometimes people find it more challenging because they're like, God, how do I think of something? But I suppose just think of what, what you want to work on essentially. And if it is something that is advancing the state of the art, well then certainly Marie Curie will consider it. So. But it doesn't have to be a very technically focused project. It certainly doesn't have to be something that could potentially turn into a product. Um, we talk quite a lot now about these um, TRL, you know, technology readiness levels and where things sit on a TRL scale. Um, and, you know, it, things don't have to be TRL 7 or 8. They don't have to be close to the market in order to be successful in this particular program. Yeah. So you, you decide what you want to work on. Does anybody on video conference have a question? Jennifer, could I just ask if, if, uh, if it's an advantage or not to link uh, one of these RISE proposals to a regular project submission to Horizon 2020? And if so, which would be the obvious one to do first? Um, I think the RISE would be the, probably the best one to do first if you haven't been involved in EU funding and you want to get an idea of what it's like um, in comparative with jumping into a big societal challenge or industrial leadership project, which is you know, a huge number of partners, massive budget, very complex to manage, I think pretty much anybody who's, who's run a research grant could coordinate a rise. It's really not an, an onerous thing. Um, you do have to be careful um, with the program. So there are rules around who can take part in it, of course, and you have to avoid double funding. So you can't have a researcher who's been paid by an FP7 or Horizon 2020 project going onto the continent because that contravenes the rules of the EU budget, which is that you can't fund the same activity from two different EU funds. Sure. People do have to be careful with that. So I would say do the rise first, and maybe when you're a year or two into the rise and you think you're comfortable with your project partner and you've got a really good idea, then think about looking for a larger Horizon 2020 project to do work. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect. Okay. Great. Okay, so I'm going to move on to talk about innovative training networks now. So ITN is a very, very different program. So I think that's the nice thing about Marie Curie. It's quite diverse. There are lots of different things that you can apply for. And um, ITN really is about quality of research training. So I mean, I know over the last number of years, the UK has been moving from a system of allocating doctoral places just widely across the institutions and giving funding for them to moving more towards these doctoral training centers and doctoral training schools instead. So this is kind of like a pan-European doctoral training school. And this is um, the involves partly the ETM program um, that Theresa mentioned earlier. So essentially what this program is about, it's a consortium of organizations, again, from different countries and different sectors. In this particular program, 
you're probably better to focus on countries in Europe, although you can bring in a couple of other countries from outside as well. Um, what you receive is funding to recruit researchers into a research training program, typically a structured PhD program, although it is possible to fund master's students in this program as well, if that's what you're interested in. In addition to the research training that they receive, um, they also receive good training in transferable and complementary skills as well, so that's an essential part. Additionally, each researcher would go on a secondment, at least one, during their project, ideally to a different sector. So if the researcher was recruited into University of Ulster to work for a project on three years, they might spend six months at a company in another country, or six months again in a charity in another country working on something. And again, the consortium receives a budget to organize these training and networking events for the researchers as well. This is a fully funded program, so the researcher's salary is covered with a very generous budget for research training and networking costs and a very generous budget for management and overheads for the program as well. So this one, we just got the results from 2015 um, at the beginning of this week. Uh, the next call is scheduled to open tentatively in September of this year and close in January. It's a horrible time. It's going to be the 10th of January, I think, which means terrible eating into Christmas holidays for everybody. But they're constrained with the deadlines and availability facilities. This is the part of the program that is most competitive. So the success rate overall for this program this year was in around 7% of applications that were funded. So the standard is extremely high. Now there are three different parts of the program. One of them is the most competitive one and it's, it's the one that pulls down the average and the other two are slightly better. So I'll explain that as I go through. So within ITN we essentially have three different kinds of programs that you can apply for. We have the industrial doctorate, the joint doctorate and the European training network. The European Trading Networks have been around in Marie Curie in some format since about Framework 4. They've had various different names, but at the moment they're called the ETN. Um, they are probably the most competitive part of the Marie Curie program. Uh, they have a history, people know what they are, people like them, everybody wants to apply for them. European Industrial Doctorate started in 2012 as a pilot and uh, have gained in popularity over time, and the European Joint Doctorates has been moved from the old Erasmus Mundus program, Erasmus, Erasmus Mundus Joint Doctorates, um, into Marie Curie because the programs are so similar. They felt it was silly funding two similar programs in different parts of the EU budget, so they basically merged them all into Marie Curie. Curie. So what they have in common is that they all tend to be projects that last for 48 months. Um, the minimum that you need for a European industrial doctorate is slightly different from the norm. It's actually only two partners, so two beneficiaries in two countries from two different sectors. So we have a couple of examples. We have, say, Queen's University Belfast working with Bell Labs Alcatel Lucent in Dublin on a joint doctorate program, sorry, an industrial doctorate program, where they have four researchers um, working on that. You can make it bigger if you like, but the minimum is only two. For the joint doctorate, you need to have three academic beneficiaries in three different countries. So it needs to be, say, a university in France, a university in Germany, a university in Poland. That's an eligible consortium. And for European Trading Network, it's three beneficiaries in three countries. And this includes then, uh, it could be companies as well. It doesn't have to be always academic. On top of that, you can have what's called partner organizations. Um, and they can come from any sector, and they can have uh, basically no minimum or no maximum. Partner organizations have a sort of an ancillary role in the project. So they don't actually recruit in and host any researchers on a full-time basis. Um, what they do is they offer training opportunities and secondment opportunities for the researchers that are hosted by the network. So you'll see on my next slide that I like to illustrate these consortia as kind of a circle with the coordinator in the middle. And I always think of the partner organization as being another circle on the outside of that, where the researchers recruited into the middle circle can travel outside, and where people from those organizations can come in every so often to deliver training and expertise to the researchers. The researchers are called early stage researchers, that's the terminology that we use, and they are funded for any duration from three to 36 months, although for obviously for most people, if they're putting together a PhD program, they always ask for 36 months. Um, if you keep your industrial doctorate small and you just have two beneficiaries, you can request up to five early stage researchers to take part in your program. If you make it three or four or five or six or seven beneficiaries, you can ask for up to 15. And typically, people tend to go for something like, for every one beneficiary, they each get one student. So if it's six beneficiaries, there'll be six students, or maybe seven, the coordinator might, might take two, it depends. 
And then for the other two modes, it's the 15 early stage researchers, and the majority would ask for maximum 15 when they actually put these applications in. So the educational requirements at the end. So at the end of an industrial doctorate program, the researcher, they don't have to have completed it, but they must be well on their way to getting a PhD. And the trick with this one is that they actually have to spend 50% of their time working in the non-academic sector. So in the example that I used of Queen's University and Alcatel-Lucent, those four researchers are spending 18 of their 36 months actually working in Alcatel-Lucent in the company. And I've spoken to people from Alcatel-Lucent and they're basically saying, look, it's the world's longest job interview. We will hire these people when they finish. We're trying to train them up in a particular niche area that's of interest to the company. We couldn't find graduates on the market who were trained in this area, so we're bringing them in, we're doing it ourselves, and basically they'll get a job in Alcatel-Lucent at the end of the day. So, good for them. Um, at the end of the European Joint Doctorate, as you would suspect by the name, the researchers must be well on their way to getting a joint or a double PhD degree. So joint where the two institutions jointly award it and the researcher receives one par parchment with the two logos and details of the two institutions on it, or a double, which is where they receive two PhDs, one from each institution. Typically, the researchers then would have to spend at least a year in both organizations in order to get a double degree. So they might spend, typically they do half and half, so they have to spend minimum a year in the other one as well. Now as you can imagine, that does require a little bit of lobbying or a little bit of work at a higher level than the research office. Um, it generally requires your pro vice chancellor to be heading off to wherever it is, Oxford, and saying, hey, you know, do you want to do a joint doctorate program with us? You have some experience in joint doctorates. There's a couple running here. Is there a rack of one? Uh, yes, but not, not through not through Marie Curie, but. Marie Curie, but I think you need, if you are going to do that, you need to have it approved through research. Okay. Committee. Yeah. Um, so you should be alerting us at the early stage and also alerting the research office, uh, Angela Remy, after they get into doctorate. Hmm. Um, so you have to let us know. And it is a little bit more complex, as you said, kind of needs the the authorities at the highest level to, to enter into an agreement. Yeah. So, um, what most people are doing when they're applying for this is they're sort of getting preliminary approval okay. from the authorities yeah. and then they're saying, well, look, if we actually get the funding, then we'll have to think seriously about having a proper agreement with this other university. Um, you know, there are existing agreements for joint degrees with certain universities, so you can even find out through your research office which institutions you already have an agreement with and go for that. The reason why I talk, I sort of talk a lot about joint doctorates, I think it's a nice idea, but also it's less competitive. So the training network success rate was about 6.3%. It was closer to 10 this year for joint doctorates and 10 for EID. So in terms of getting the funding, the other two are kind of a better bet. So. Um, and finally, just to say that at the end of a training network, most people put together a PhD program, but you don't have to get a degree out of it. So if you have an industry partner who wants to get involved in an ETM, but they're kind of saying, oh, look, I don't want to get into the business of having to educate a researcher to PhD level, um, you can put forward industry research positions within those networks that don't lead to a doctoral degree at the end or don't lead to a master's degree at the end as well. So again, a couple of examples of projects. So this one is a nice one with a little bit of a cross-border aspect as well. So it's, it's um, coordinated by Queen, um, and it involves DCU and TE Laboratories, which is a small lab in County Carlo. So this one has like 10 partners, sorry, it's 11 partners, and it has basically one, two, three, four, nine, six, seven, sorry, it's 10, it used to be 11, one dropped out. Um, seven academic partners, three non-academic partners, and they have a budget there of about 3.9 million euro. I think they're getting 14 PhD students through that program. And each of, them, each of those organizations will recruit at least one PhD student. In addition to that, they have 13 partner organizations. Within that, there's one each from the US and Canada. And the researchers will basically get the chance to spend time in those partner organizations as well. So it's a really kind of nice, diverse PhD experience or research training experience um, for a researcher. Second example again involves Queen's and um, a company in the Republic of Ireland called Irish Laboratory Diagnostic Services. Um, and this is one of these EIDs that only involves two partners. And actually, about 50% of the applications for this program are ones that just involve two, and about 50% of the successful ones are ones that just involve two. It's quite simple to do. 
and in this one they have enough funding, I think it's for three students or four students who will spend 50% of their time in the lab in the Republic and will spend 50% of their time in Queen's. It doesn't have to be 50-50, you know, down the line, it can be a month here, a month there, as long as it adds up to that at the end of the day. And my final example is one of a European joint doctorate. Um, these consortia tend to be smaller. Um, eight to ten beneficiaries is typical for an ETM. Um, for the moment, it seems to be more like four to six for a joint doctorate. And you can see the majority of these actually are universities. This, in fact, was the only successful project of the eight funded last year that I could find that had a, a, a company or non-academic um, beneficiary. But all of them had partner organisations, which were companies and charities and NGOs. So, um, as I said, there's three partner organisations in that one, um, including Bausch and Loeb, the contact lens manufacturer. So, it's obviously relevant to dry eyes. So, I was interested in. Okay, so before I move on, then, is there any queries on ITN? Yes, ladies back. Hello. It depends, actually. Um, generally, private hospitals are considered to be non-academic, and public hospitals, teaching hospitals, are considered to be academic. They fall within the academic sector. But it depends on the individual hospital. Um, and the only way you can find out is by getting them to register as a participant in Horizon 2020. And then they get somebody appointed, a legal entity appointed representative. They're called a LEAR of the organization. And the LEAR can find out whether they've been classified as academic or non-academic. And if they don't like the classification and can provide evidence that it should be changed, well, they can do so. Um, but that takes time. So it's not the sort of thing you'd want to be doing two weeks before the deadline. Um, you need to be looking at that now. I think we found recently, so we had the, the Matter Private Hospital in Dublin, or the Matter Hospital in Dublin is considered as non-academic, but St. Vincent's Hospital is considered as academic. So it depends on the relationship, yeah. I think they are non academic. Yeah. Yeah. So I think off top of the head they're already of non academic. Mm. Yeah. Could be it depends. Yeah. Um I think like in that example that Jennifer gives that we're um, coordinating and the Southern Trust is involved, it's actually could have a hold. Right. But right. they're rather than. Yeah. Yeah, the legal, the legal, the legal, legal representative. Yeah, the legal representative is obviously the trust, not the hospital. So. Yeah. yeah. My question was that, actually, yeah. you know, what are the non academic partners or considered could be government departments as well? NGOs? Yeah, exactly. So, um, like public organisations whose main mission is research, so places like Chagask and the Marine Institute down south would be considered as um, would be considered as academic, um, but say government departments, public sector would generally be non-academic. Yeah. And as I said, if you don't like the classification, you can argue for it to be changed. Uh, yeah. Is there anything on the video comment? EID. Could yeah. I just ask in the EID? I think was the. One, the only one where y you could have just one partner, and in this yes. case, one north and south. Could that be two yes. academic institutions, or does one have to be a non? One has to be non. One has to be non for the, those. Yes. Ones. You can make it. You can make it three, so you can have two academic and one non-academic. Um, ah, okay. So it, okay. Okay, and and it could work just on this island without necessarily having a, another European. Yeah, it can work fine. If you, if you just have two, it can work fine just on this island. And we have a couple of examples actually of, of industrial doctors that have been funded with that cross border thing. Um, we definitely have that. We have the Queen's one from FP7, we have the new one now from um, the one that I showed the um, metaphor. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of examples. Um, what we have found in looking at the evaluation results is that if you decide to make it three, then you're more competitive if you make it three countries as well. So if you were to have two partners in Northern Ireland and one partner in the Republic of Ireland, that's not as competitive. And the reason for that is that the evaluators wouldn't consider it to be as international as a program that has three different countries involved in it. So we did a little bit of analysis last year. So if you're going to add another partner and make it three, you're better off to look at another jurisdiction in another country. Yes. Thank you.
Okay. Anyone else? Great. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is just briefly introduce co-fund and night, and then we'll move on to the main sort of meat of this talk, which is the individual fellowship. So. Um, CoFund essentially is a co-financing program. It's where people who have funding to fund either a doctoral students, a cohort of doctoral students, or a cohort of postdoctoral or more senior researchers can take that, turn it into a program, and then apply to the commission for co-financing to basically upscale that program and get more researchers in. They began this program in FP7 where they co-funded 175 fellowship programs. This time around, you can apply also for doctoral programs. We didn't have that in the past. And the co-funding rate is in and around 50%. So up to a maximum of 10 million euro per program, although people don't tend to go for that. Um, we had a success recently in UCD where they asked for about 900,000 euro for a program to fund seven or eight postdoctoral researchers um, in one of the centers in UCD. Um, and they would have got match funding um, on that basis. And the success rate for this is quite good. About 25% of projects are funded. Um, just to show you an example from FP7, uh, they managed to put together a fund um, through looking at their own budgets and finding money from different places for the new UCD Energy Institute. Um, they then put that together as a program for 21 postdoctoral fellowships and applied to the commission for the co-financing. Um, in that case, they got 40% financing. That's because that's, that was the rule that FP7 has changed now. Um, and essentially, they have put together a like, maybe like a little mini funding agency within UCD where they then advertise the positions. Um, the researchers come in, they sort of choose a supervisor and they write a proposal together and then UCD organizes an international peer review process to select the researchers. If you do a doctoral program, it doesn't have to be international peer review, but you do have to have a, a robust kind of transparent process and um, just select the particular researchers that come along in the program. Um, so I was just at to read at the start when we were trying to get the video conference up and running. And you know, and there there is potential for some of the sort of larger scale research institutes or doctoral training schools um, at UU to look at this particular program. Uh, just to say, if any of you are in the room and you are looking at postdoctoral opportunities, obviously those fellowship programs that were funded during FP7 and the four ones from the first round of Horizon 2020 are looking to recruit people like you, um, and quite handily. All of the vacancies in these programs and the calls for fellowships are advertised on the one place, which is the Your Access Jobs website. And Your Access is the EU's European Researcher Mobility Portal. It provides information on researcher rights, uh, jobs, um, links to non-European countries, and also um, practical advice on moving to different countries um, within Europe. So, as I said, there are different schemes. Each one has different rules and regulations. But if you just set up a you know, sign up to your access and set up a search alert, you'll get an email every time something comes up that matches your needs. European Research is nice then is sort of the fifth action. This comes up every two years. It's very different. It's about public engagement. It's trying to encourage people to think about research as a career. And so you can apply for full or part financing to run um, an event on the last Friday of September each year. Um, and it's a European-wide event. So countries from all over Europe apply, and events happen all over Europe as well. And last year we had, the, I think it was the 27th of September, and this year it'll be the 26th. TCD and the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland got together and applied for funding to organise two <coughs> events, as said, in 2014 and 2015. And we were happy to be there on the day doing the European Corner, which is trying to tell people about what the EU does. Um, so if any of you are involved in education, outreach, public engagement activities, it might be something to have a look at. The next call is in 2016 and we'll cover events in 2016 and 2017. Okay, so finally, we're getting there to individual fellowships. So individual fellowships is what I said. It's an individual fellowship to support a period of mobility awarded to an individual researcher in collaboration with the host organization. The programs are open to anybody who, at the call deadline, which is 10th September this year, meets the designation of an experienced researcher. So that's somebody who either has their PhD, so has passed their viva before the 10th September, or has four years of full-time equivalent research experience after their undergraduate degree. So actually, if you've been working on your PhD for four and a half years and haven't finished it, you would be eligible. It's not really supposed to capture people in that situation. It's more for people who are working in countries where they've been working in research without a PhD. And you know, in not, every, not every country requires you to have a PhD to, to work in a research environment. 
There is no upper age or experience limit for these programs. I often hear people say, oh, that's a program for young researchers. Um, and apart from the fact that I hate that ageist phrase, um, basically you can be at any stage in your career and apply for one of these fellowships. So people are looking at them now for sabbaticals as well, for when they take a career break, they maybe go away for a year or two and work in a different environment and get funded to do that. They are fully funded again, salary is covered, research costs, management overheads, etc. You can choose an academic or a non-academic host. Um, predominantly people choose academic hosts, but you can, if you like, choose a non-academic organization. The minimum duration of a fellowship is a year, and the success rates for these are sort of in between, say 10 and 15, it was more like 10 and 18% this year actually, and I'll go into that later. There are two types of, of European, two types of individual fellowship, the European Fellowship and the Global Fellowship. The European Fellowship lasts for anything between one and two years, and can take place at any organization within Europe. Uh, now when I say Europe, it means 28 member states, but also there are about 10 countries in the region of Europe that have bought into Horizon 2020, places like Norway, Turkey, Israel, uh, Ukraine has just done it actually, um, Iceland, so they are considered as Europe as well. So any researcher anywhere in the world of any nationality can apply to do a fellowship within Europe on the European Fellowships Programme. Then we have the Global Fellowship Programme, which is slightly different. That's about taking researchers who are from Europe and here, or are long-term residents, sending them outside Europe, and, you know, obviously the most popular destination is America, most people want to go there. They get to go there for between one and two years, and then they get a fully funded reintegration year back in Europe at a host institution of their choice. So it's quite possible to use this fellowship to go from University of Ulster, where you've been for years, go off to Canada for a year or two to work on something, and be fully funded to come back into the University of Ulster for that year. So how it works in terms of applications is, if you're going for a European fellowship, you find a host organization in Europe, and you find a supervisor who will support your application. Uh, together you apply with them. If you're successful, the host organization, so Ulster in this case, signs the contract with the European Commission, and then they basically employ you on your fellowship for those two years. For global fellowships, again, the researcher applies with the European host, but with the support of the non-European host. So you obviously have two organizations there. So the example I always use is, say, Harvard. So if University of Ulster will put in your application with you, and Harvard will give you a letter of commitment to say, if this is successful, we will host this person, and we're very excited to have them. The host then, again, University of Ulster signs a contract uh, with the commission, and the non-European host signs an agreement with them. A not particularly strong agreement, but it just kind of sets out terms and conditions for the program. The University of Ulster then employs the researcher, and then they second you out to the non-European host. So you'll still receive all of your salary, etc. You'll pay all your social security contributions um, within here in the University of Ulster. Um, and then you will be seconded out to the non-European host for up to two years. And there may be arrangements in that agreement between the two organizations that you could, they could try to sort of transfer your research costs, for example, out there as well. Mobility, again, is key in these programs. Sorry, take it back to the question. If you apply to the University of Ulster and um, seconded to a Harvard, you actually have to physically go there for the full two years if you apply. You have to be there. Yeah, this is not kind of, you know, virtual mobility. You have to relocate and go there. Yeah. Yes? No, you don't, yeah, you don't have to have any existing relationship um, with, the, with uh, the person who will hire you at the end of the fellowship. You also don't have to choose Ulster. Like, you, you could choose anywhere in, in Europe. You could choose the Max Planck Institute in Germany, for example, go off to Harvard and come back to the Max Planck Institute. So, um, but there's no, yeah, you don't have to be a pre-existing employee or have any pre-existing connections. So. Are you on a contract? Do you then have a yeah, we had an issue. Uh, we had a, a occasion last year where someone was applying for a global fellowship and his contract uh, was coming to an end. So he was waiting to be applying for the fellowship, then we could say. Yeah. Um, so it could mean a break. Yeah. Then the HR would have kept with it, then his contract and then to come with him. Uh, yeah. So that was that messy, but mm -hmm. HR will work with us. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're saying that you've got to finish the PhD or you have four years yeah. research experience. Yeah. What qualifies as research experience? Are there, are there rules, like quite specific rules about because I some of so, I've done in my PhD my previous job was kind of you could potentially argue that it was research. Yeah, it's so yeah, if no, and it can be industry research as well. It could be right. research in a public organisation. Um, essentially, if you put in the application form, and the application form is quite detailed about where you've been working for the last number of years, where you've been living for the last number of years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, if the people who do the eligibility checking are in any way in doubt, they will contact you and they will say, "Please give us proof that this position that you held from X year to X year in this organisation was in fact a research position." And so you'd have to be able to show them a contract that said. So and so's duties include research and development, research and innovation, and whatever. So you do have to have proof of that. Now it's full time equivalent, right? So it can be four years part time done over a twenty year period. It doesn't have to be like four years consecutively. It can be a year here, twenty years ago. It can be two years, ten years ago. As long as it all, since you got your undergraduate degree, adds up. But you do have to be able to provide documentary evidence of it. Um, that is the key thing because they will ask for it, um, and that's fair enough. Yes? Yeah, I'm going to get to that now actually on my next slide, is that okay? It depends on how long you've been in, in the UK. Well, you can, absolutely. So if you just let me move on to my next one, I'll explain that, right? So because mobility is a key thing in the program, you can't apply for a fellowship in a country where you've lived for more than a year in three years before the call deadline. So you need to look at where you've been since the 10th of September 2012 and the 10th of September 2015 and see how long you've been. So what that means is if you're currently studying or working in Northern Ireland, which of course is the UK, um, and you've been here for longer than a year, you must go to another country for your European fellowship. You can't go to anywhere in the UK. You can apply with the Republic of Ireland, you can apply with France, with Norway, with Israel, with Liechtenstein, wherever you want to go within Europe, but you have to move. Now, with the global fellowship, the rule applies to the country outside Europe. So if you've been in the University of Ulster for 10 years, you couldn't apply in the UK for a European fellowship, but you could apply for the global fellowship returning to University of Ulster. They make no designation about that basically. So you can go away as long as you go away outside Europe for global fellowship. If you're not a European citizen or national, you do have to be able to prove that you've lived, worked or studied in Europe for five years before applying. And similar to that gentleman's question about the experience, you have to be able to prove that. So if they came back and asked you for proof, you'd have to have letters to say, you know, I was registered as a student in the University of Vienna for three years from here to here. So you have to be able to prove it. If you've recently moved to Northern Ireland, as the lady in the blue jacket has, um, you could apply for a European fellowship with the place that you're currently working here in the University of Ulster or with any other organisation within the United Kingdom. Yeah. If you lived in the United Kingdom more than a year, you could not apply for the European fellowship in the United Kingdom. So, so if you came from Germany and have been six months in the UK, you could apply in the UK for a fellowship. And again, you could apply for the Global Fellowship if you've been in Europe for more than five years um, before you apply, if you're not already from there. So there's three different types of European Fellowship actually in between it. So they have kind of two options for people at different levels. So the, um, the first kind, the, most, the largest one is the Standard European Fellowship, and that's for people again who meet this mobility rule. Um, the proposals are taken in and are ranked in separate disciplinary areas. So I did say at the start that Marie Curie covers all research areas. They handle the evaluation by dividing them into eight different panels and you choose the panel you go into. There's also the reintegration panel and that's for people who wish to or recently have relocated to Europe from outside. So if you're somebody who did your PhD in University of Edinburgh, who then went to University of Melbourne or Australia for two years for a postdoc, um, has come back to University of Ulster within the last two years actually, uh, you can actually apply for a reintegration panel fellowship to stay here. People who apply for this must be nationals or previous long-term residents of an EU country. 
And because this is trying to attract people to come back, they've relaxed the mobility rule. So instead of no more than a year in the last three years, no more than three years in the last five years. So you could have come back within the last two years before the call deadline, or you'd still be eligible. The final option is something called the career restart panel. And that's for people who have taken a career break for any reason at all, for at least 12 months before the call deadline. And again, they have the relaxed mobility rule. So if you know somebody who has taken time off care for a sick relative or raise kids or in some countries it would be say military service for example that people have to take a break from they can actually do and so they keep these people separate and they rank them all in one panel just by themselves so you're not being compared to somebody who hasn't had a break um, in their career and just to say that if you are someone who's had a break in the past even if you don't qualify for the career restart panel the evaluators can take those break or they do take those breaks into account during the evaluation they can say well look that person was away from research for, for four years, five years ago, um, and so they have a break in their publication record and they take that into account when they evaluate you. So the one thing that's really important about these to understand is that this is not an application for a research project. It's an application for a career development fellowship. So it's training through research through an individual project that you define with the supervisor. It's about building in a program to train you in additional scientific and research skills in transferable skills that could take you into careers within and outside of academia like communication, intellectual property, entrepreneurship, research integrity for example. And it's also about building in the option if you wish to have uh, a succumbent period in another organisation within Europe or another organisation, um, another organisation ideally in a different sector. So if you were to apply with the University of Ulster you could say well look there's a company down the road that I'd like to spend time with or there's a Department of whatever agriculture I'd like to spend time in, and you can build that into your into your fellowship as well. You can spend up to six months of a two-year fellowship, and I think if you take a year-long fellowship, you can spend up to three months somewhere else. I, in addition, then they like you to get involved in actually managing the research and managing the finances of the fellowship as well to um, become involved in organising and taking part in events, including public engagement and to have training on things like gender, ethics, research integrity, responsible research and innovation, etc. And the whole thing is managed through a career development plan. So you don't submit a career development plan when you put the application together, but you have to, in your proposal, describe how you'll put together the plan and who will help you with preparing it and monitoring it and making sure that you basically you know, use it properly as time goes on. Just to give you a couple of examples of people who were funded in this program during Framework 7, um, the first person is a lady called Elena Martinez. She actually works in one of our research funding agencies now, but she originally moved to UCD, um, I think from Italy, in 2009, and then applied for a Marie Curie Fellowship um, in 2010 after she had arrived. The second example is somebody who's much more senior. It's Professor Gary Studi, and he is a um, space science researcher who worked in NASA since 1992 and he started working with the Limerick Institute of Technology um, in 2002 on a joint project uh, exchanging students from MIT out to, uh, to NASA. And then he basically said, well look, I'd really like to come over and so he applied for a fellowship and he came over and spent two years in MIT. Uh, the final example is quite a nice one, it's Issa Gowan. She went on a global fellowship and she went to Japan to the, the Kobe Institute. She spent two years there and when she came back to UCD, she started putting together her application for an ERC starting grant, which she won um, in 2013. Um, we have quite a few examples like that of people using this program as a sort of stepping step on this ladder to get to an ERC grant. Um, the stats from Framework 6 show that people who either were a Marie Curie Fellow or were involved in running a Marie Curie project, like an ITN, were more likely to get an ERC award than their peers. So we're already seeing examples of that um, coming through. So it's something to think of, particularly for people who are sort of thinking, I'd like to apply for ERC in a couple of years, um, but I need to basically big up my research profile. I need to do a bit more. So why don't I go away for a little while and, and do that? So moving away from the personal reasons as to why you might want to apply for it, I just want to deal slightly with this reasons why research organizations, why the principal investigators, the people running the research teams, would like to get involved in these programs. And that's really, I think, for four reasons. There's a really good opportunity to try and use this program to attract researchers to come to University of Ulster for a fellowship. 
There's also an opportunity to look at leading researchers, people like Gary Stutty, who are mature in their career, who can really bring something here, and you might get them over on that, and then maybe look to see, could they apply for something else to keep them here? Or maybe you'd be happy to have them for two years and then let them go back to their home organization. You'd get enough out of them out of those two years. There's an opportunity to look at building links with research groups worldwide, so kind of, you know, meet someone at a conference, you get chatting, you're like, you send me your best postdoc, I'll send you my best PhD student, and you, know, you can use it as a bridge to build these links. And also, I mentioned it before about this idea of using it to fund a sabbatical abroad, um, maybe upskilling for an E or C award. Just to say that, um, obviously, if you are thinking about using this for a sabbatical or a career break, um, you do need to talk to your head of school or head of department about it. And how all the finances and everything are managed is really up to the University of Ulster to sort out. The Marie Curie programme will give the money for the salary, will give the money for the research costs, and then you have to figure out you know, whether they'll pay you that salary while you're away, whether they'll continue to pay your existing salary and offset some of the costs using the Marie Curie money. That's really an internal arrangement um, for you, you to sort out. Funding model, just to let you know how much this kind of works out as. So um, you basically get um, a living allowance, a mobility allowance, and if you have family commitments, so if you have, um, you're married, you are in a civil partnership or other uh, legal relationship recognised by uh, national legislation in a European country, um, or you have dependent children, regardless of not whether or not you, they live with you, um, you can get this extra allowance. I've converted it into um, British pounds based on the exchange rate on Tuesday. I know it's fluctuating a little bit, so it may not be quite exact um, today. Um, but essentially, when you add all these together, and that's per month, um, it's, quite a good, it's quite an attractive salary. Now, the one thing you have to be aware of is that those rates are inclusive of employers' costs. So Ulster will top slice off an amount for employers' PRSI and employers' pension costs as well. But still, I know in the Republic of Ireland, anybody on a Marie Curie fashion would be earning 20 to 30 percent more than a typical postdoctoral researcher, and I think it's probably the same um, here in, in the UK as well. A country correction coefficient does apply to the living allowance for sort of purchasing parity power index, and that's actually 120.3. So you can actually multiply um, 120.3 percent on top of the, um, the living allowance uh, as well. So it does actually increase the living allowance because it's the UK. If you were to go to um, say the UK or the US. What happens is for the first two years, your living allowance is corrected by the US coefficient, and then when you come back, you, it's converted corrected by the UK coefficient. The US one, I think, is slightly less, actually, as well. There is also a contribution as well for researcher training and networking costs. It's 800 euro a month, so it's 9,600 euro a year. It's quite good. Um, and this management and indirect cost is 650 uh, euro a year. So in terms of that, applying, if you are a prospective fellow, what you really have to do is find the host organization and a supervisor who wants to support you. Obviously, you need two of each for a global fellowship. Have a look for advertisements on the Your Access Jobs webpage. Quite often, organizations will um, put up a post saying, we really like people to apply with us for a Marie Curie fellowship. Also, LinkedIn, lots of LinkedIn groups are advertising them. I'm currently putting them on my LinkedIn group. People from around the world are sending me things. I've just launched a web page, I haven't put it up live yet, it's being built um, for organisations in the Republic of Ireland to advertise themselves as potential hosts for fellowships as well, so um, that will be live quite soon, and say other countries like Spain and Germany, I basically copied them, they did it first. Um, so you write the application together with the organisation and the supervisor, you submit the application and the results actually are generally sent to the supervisor um, as well. Oh, sorry, I missed one. Okay, if you're a prospective supervisor, what you essentially have to do is find an applicant. So again, you can advertise, you can put out the feeders through your personal contacts, through LinkedIn, you can place an ad on your access, you can log on to the your access website as an employer and search the CV database, which is something like 40,000 CVs on it. Um, again, you write the application, you submit the application and the results um, are sent to you. There's two parts of the application form, administrative forms, that's what Teresa and Olivia are here for to help you with those forms. You fill them out online. Um, you need to create a, something called an ECAS account. It's very quick, you just log in and register, and uh, that then becomes your master login for accessing everything to do with the European Commission. So you just have one login for everything. Um, you need something called the participant identification code of the organization to submit. 
Those again are searchable online or you can get them from the research office and just always remember that the call deadlines are Brussels time. So the call deadline is 5 o'clock on the 10th of September but that's 4 o'clock UK time. So don't miss the deadline. You'd be amazed at the amount of people who actually get that wrong and go on and submit, try and submit at 4 past 4 and find the whole system is closed. And they don't take the dog to take my homework excuses unfortunately. If you don't get it in on time, you don't get it in. Um, the main proposal itself is what we call the Part B. Um, you download a Word template and it's actually rich text format so you can use it in other word processing software, it doesn't have to be Microsoft Word. From inside the online system, you complete the proposal, you save it as a PDF and you then upload it to the online system. It's possible to submit as many times as you like, so I always say to people, do a trial submission a couple of days before the deadline, you know, and then at least you know if something goes through, um, they take the last one that you submitted basically as the final version, so it's useful. The proposal itself, the Part B, is about 15 pages long. Um, you have 10 pages for a section on excellence, a section on impact, and a section on implementation. You have five pages to put in your own CV. Um, then there are two tables that have to be filled out, or sorry, one table per host. So if it's a normal fellowship, you fill out a table. It just asks questions about, you know, where they've been involved in research programs before, what kind of facilities and infrastructure they have, basic information about the organization. There's a section on ethics, and for the global fellowship, you have to have a letter of commitment from the organization outside of Europe. In terms of the evaluation, they do a combination of remote evaluation and then people coming to Brussels for meetings. So they allocate your proposal to three disciplinary experts in your field. They come to Brussels, they meet, they agree on the scores and comments for your application, and then that's all fed into a system which generates a ranking list. Um, it takes about eight months to get your grant agreement signed after you've submitted your fellowship application. So typically people would start either at that eight months or you can wait for another year if you like. The eight evaluation panels are shown on the screen there. As you can see, they're extremely broad and you just choose the one that goes in. There is a list of descriptors that helps you to choose you know, which one it should go into. It's quite long. Um, for the Global Fellowships and Standard European Fellowship, the ranking list comes out and say it's chemistry or it's social sciences or it's physics. For the reintegration and career restart fellowship, you're actually ranked in a multidisciplinary way, but the evaluators will still be people from your discipline. So it's not like you're going to get a physics evaluator if you're a chemist, for example. They will be people who are within your area. Just to show you, interestingly, this is data for the Republic of Ireland. I just did this last week. Um, we have found over time that this program has become increasingly popular in the area of social sciences and humanities. So actually the most successful, the largest number of fellowships in Ireland was granted to the area of social sciences um, and humanities. And we're starting to see in the larger programs like ITN and RISE, the social sciences and humanities are starting to increase the level of applications here too. The evaluations, um, you get 50% for the excellence, so you get 30% for the impact section and 20% for the implementation. It's the same as all of Horizon 2020. And in order to be in the ranking list, you have to get at least 70%. Um, in reality, in order to get a fellowship, you want to be scoring maybe 90 plus marks. That's really where the threshold is for funding. If you get over 70, yeah, you've made the minimum requirement, but really to be funded needs to be 90, 90 or more. I'm not going to go through this, it's just up there for illustration just to show you what they look for under each of these areas, but essentially under excellence it's about the research, the training and transfer of knowledge plans, the quality of the host organisation and the quality of the researcher. For impact, they're looking at the impact on the researcher's career and the impact on economy and society in, in terms of communicating and dissemination of the results. And for implementation, it's all about the work plan, the management plan, and uh, the infrastructure and facilities that are available in the organization. So it's quite broad and quite a lot to get into 10 pages. It's quite challenging um, in order to do that. Just to mention to you a little added bonus. So there's a thing called the Charter and Code, which was released in uh, 2005, I think. Yeah, it was 2005, which outlined 40 principles about career management and career development for research. <coughs> Those principles are embedded in the evaluation criteria for Marius Godofsky Curie and essentially organizations can do a self-assessment and if they complete that self-assessment they can get this badge of excellence, the HR Excellence in Research logo and both universities here in Northern Ireland have that logo. They do it through the researchers concordat and what it means is that when you're putting in your application you can stick this HR logo all over it and it kind of um, 
shows the evaluators that the organisation is committed to career development and open transparent recruitment and all those nice principles of the chartering code. So there's a little bit of an advantage. So just to give you an idea of the call timetable, then it's published now. The deadline is the 10th September. You'll get the results by February next year and you can start the fellowship as early as May 2016, but you can postpone it for up to 12 months if you want. And that's quite useful for planning. You know, if you have a contract that you're currently on and you want to try and time things so you finish one and start another, you can certainly do that. Yeah, okay, I'll just get through success rates then. So success rates, I mentioned between 10 and 15 percent. I was slightly off with that. The global fellowship last year was the most competitive, so 11.3 percent. And the um, European fellowship was in and around 18 to 19 percent. So it's not bad actually in terms of success rate. Global fellowship has a smaller portion of the budget, so that's why. So just to give you some, uh, I suppose, information on how I, we can help you um, with this, in addition to the supports that are offered by your research office, I do have two things for information and support. So email distribution list, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter, we have a YouTube channel and uh, you can basically use those as sources of information and training as well. Um, whenever we're coming around to calls, about two months before the call deadline, I always do a webinar which goes through the entire program in detail, including how to write a good proposal. Um, you can watch those live or you can basically look at them on YouTube, they're already up there, uh, the ones from last year and from previous calls. If you have an idea and you're not sure whether it fits, if you're not sure whether you're eligible, you should get in touch with either Teresa or myself and we can advise on that. And what we're also doing now is a series of proposal writing workshops for the individual fellowships call. So if you are serious about putting a proposal together, you can come along, it's a three and a half hour workshop which I run in the IUA offices. Um, I'll probably do them in August, I think, because June is starting to pack up a little bit. Um, the idea of it is it's a kind of hands-on, half-day interactive proposal writing workshop. So it's not sitting listening to me talking for three and a half hours. It's basically working in groups. And the idea is that when you leave, you should go with the nuts and bolts of a good proposal, or at least what should go into um, a good proposal. And some of the analysis that we've done from last year when we did these for the first time is that it definitely improves the success rates. People who come to the workshop do better than people who don't, essentially. Um, it's for applicants, but it's also for people who are going to supervise applicants. And if you come together, that works really well, actually. I've had a few people who have come with their supervisor, and that's worked really nicely because then they both go away with the idea of what needs to go into a proposal. And uh, those will be held in my office in, in Dublin too. I'll advertise them through my usual channels, but through Teresa, and um, if you're very welcome to come along to them if we have enough places. I'm planning on doing two. Um, I could probably take about 12 people in each one, but if there's more demand, I'll do more. Absolutely fine. So thank you for that. And thank you to the people on the video conference. I know I kind of raced through it there, but I was aware that I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions um, at the end about the fellowship programme. Is there anything else you want to ask apart from what you asked already? No. Why ask? Is there anyone who have been applying to the fellowship program or to go somewhere or to? Yeah, these are the same. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they're chatting them. They've been 10 years. Well, <coughs> Uh, European or global? Um, European. Um, I don't know what the stats are like in the UK, but. Uh, the drought we tend to do our success rate for global fellowships is always much higher than in the European fellowships. So we were the opposite. About 20% of our global fellowship applications were funded and only about 12% of our European applications were funded. So we seem to do better for some reason with the people going away who want to come back in again. So um, I wouldn't let that 11.3% put you off. Um, I think being in the country that you're going to come back to is a real benefit in terms of the support that you can get, and so it really helps to improve the quality of your application. You know. Yeah. Anybody on video conference have any questions? So, if we have an existing PhD student who'd like to send them a global fellowship, is that allowed? So they they 
rather than having yep. us recruit someone else, it's okay to have a, a resident PhD student who goes away for two years and then comes back to new you for a year? Yes, absolutely, that's fine. Uh, if there's somebody who's not a European national, they have to be able to prove they've been in Europe for five years. So if it's somebody from India, for example, they would have to be able to show they've been in Europe for five years before they go. So. If they're a PhD student, they, they, they need that four years. Research. Well, they need to have the PhD before, yeah, before they before they apply. Yeah, or the four years, as you said. Yeah. For the, for the global, global yeah. You need a tool, a canvas. Yeah. Not academic. No, it doesn't have to be, no. For the, for the for the, yeah, well, for the for comment, you, you don't have to have it as a comment if you don't want to. No, no, no. It's only if you want to. So you could, in theory, have a fellowship where you go from University of Ulster to, say, Japan. Um, and then during your time in Japan or in Northern Ireland, you then go to another sector in Europe. So you could go to a company in, I don't know, Oxford, for example. But only if you want to and only if it makes sense for your fellowship. You don't have to. Is there any other questions on the video conference? Uh, it might be, a, might be a stupid question, but the, no, if, stupid. Ulster is, if Ulster is your host institute for a global fellowship, do you have to return to Ulster for your reintegration year, or yes. could you nominate the Yeah, if, if Ulster is the host at the start when you go, you have to come back to Ulster. Um, unless something terrible happens, like there's a massive breakdown in communication between you and your supervisor and you hate each other and you don't want to come back. In some cases, they will allow you to move somewhere else, but that's certainly not a given. Um, if you commit to go with Ulster, you have to come back to Ulster. Yeah. And you have to come back as well. There are all kinds of penalty clauses in the grant agreement about recouping all the funds from you and if you don't come back. So they're very strict on that. Okay, thanks. Okay. That's uh, one of the things, Jennifer, I'm a wee bit of a worry about the global one because that's one we have at the moment and we're trying to sort of set it up. And it very clearly states that the University of Ulster is liable if uh, the person doesn't come back. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know if you have any examples of templates of contracts that have already been negotiated with institutes that we can put in some sort of, I, I don't know how you would do it because you know you, you're supposed to actually recoup the money from the, the researcher uh, and, and take legal action and all the rest so I suppose it's a uh, hopefully that will never happen but it's a bit of a worry. Yeah I, I, to be honest with you I think it's it's a threat that hangs heavy over the grant agreement but I don't think they've ever enforced it. I, I don't know of an instance where the Commission has ever actually gone back and uh, taken all the money from, from the researcher um, or taken the money from the beneficiary who then goes and takes legal action. I don't think it's ever happened. Um, what they will always do is make sure that like, every effort has been made to get the researcher to come back. I mean, if somebody wants to quit, you can't really stop them from quitting, you know, if yeah. they want to give up their fellowship. Um, but uh, and you just have to be able to show that you put every effort in, you know, and, and things do happen, things change, it's, you know, it's a two year period um, yeah. and they are flexible, but I, I, I don't have any sample contracts or anything, unfortunately, no, um, as to what you can build in. Yeah, well, the, the, the finance is very good for the, you know, the researcher to come back, which actually, as you say, there's yeah. a coefficient there for the UK, so I can't imagine somebody not wanting to come back, you know. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it can be personal circumstances, and sometimes it can be just that they get a job offer somewhere else. You know, yeah. and, and you and obviously you can't really stop them from leaving if they really want to leave. Hmm? Anything else? I don't, think, don't think there's any more questions in Korean. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much everybody.